Welcome to the First Corinthians Sunday School class. Today we're in First Corinthians fourteen, twenty-six through forty. Let's open in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, please just uh, remove any distractions that we may have, and as we listen to this, Lord, and um, in whatever context, Lord, just allow the words, your words, to penetrate hearts, minds, and souls, and allow us to apply them in our lives, Lord. Just give me clarity of speech, clarity of thought. Um, Holy Spirit, speak, move me out of the way, um, and, and just really speak your word uh, to folks, Lord, through this passage. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So before we dig into today's passage, which kind of wraps up this section of 1 Corinthians, let's take a look at, uh, at the last several weeks from a, a 50,000 foot view. Remember that this section, chapters 11 through 14, is dealing with practices in the church that weren't bringing glory to God. Paul addresses head coverings, the Lord's Supper, spiritual gifts, the body of Christ and honoring the different gifts, love being the driving force, and prophecy in tongues. If you look, Paul is often dealing with pride and arrogance that they had in their misguided practices. Often they would worship, when they would worship, it was about showmanship or uh, outdoing one another. They were maneuvering and muscling for rank and, and status. They weren't using their gifts and coming together as one body. They were forcing things and tearing each other down. Paul dedicates an entire passage to love. Love should have characterized their worship and their fellowship. Paul explains what love is and what it's all about. The church at Corinth was immature, and Paul is telling them how to grow up and mature. So with that, let's look at today's passage, verses 26 through 40 of chapter 14. What then, brothers, when you come together, each has a lesson, uh, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there only, uh, let there be only two or at three, or at most three, um, and each in their turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirit of the Prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or was it for, from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that these things I am writing you are a commandment of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So, my brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy, and do not forbid speaking in tongues. But all things should be done decently and in order. So, here's a little background about what was, what was happening in the church services before we dig into today's passage. It was chaos! It was out of control! There was no rhyme or reason to their service or order of service. People would talk over each other and interrupt each other. They would sing one verse of a hymn, or uh, that is probably a psalm, and then totally 
do something different. And then sing an entire hymn of something else, or maybe a verse or, or two of this or that. And, and the songs wouldn't have particularly related each other or to a theme or an idea. It was just what people wanted to sing. You might have some folks over in a corner speaking in tongues while singing what's going on. I imagine prayer would have been a loud event with everyone speaking in tongues on top of one another, but no one knowing what was being said. When folks would prophesy, others would interrupt or, or start prophesying at the same time. Then someone would start speaking in tongues at the same time or maybe start an argument over here. Needless to say, it would have been hard to concentrate on what was going on or, or what was being said. However, they felt that this spontaneous, unstructured worship was superior, spiritually advanced, and inspired because structure wasn't getting in the way of leadings. You see, also in play in Corinth was pagan worship. Pagan worship was much the same way. It was chaos. And so as these people are coming out of that pagan culture, they're bringing that with them. And so it, it's kind of natural to think that, uh, well, you know, we, this is the way we used to worship, so this is the way that we should worship God. So let's look at today's passage. And one pastor I listened to outlined the passage with these three words, edifying, orderly, and authority. Now, I'm not going to strictly follow these points, but I think it's a good way of looking at the points of this passage. It shows how the church is to worship and approach worship. It wasn't to be a free-for-all. Look, looking at verse 26, we see Paul opens this section by calling them brothers, which is a friendly term. He loved them and wants the best for them. Continuing to look at, at verse 26, we see that each person had their own agenda come to worship. They had things they wanted to do, and with that came pride and arrogance in their hearts. No one was really thinking about submission or love when they were coming to worship. And at the end of verse 26, we see him say that, Let all things be done for building up. The church should edify and build up one another in love, instead of attacking and tearing each other down. The worship sh service should have helped people grow in their walk and understanding of God. So for them, I, I, I think that if their hymn or lesson didn't particularly fit the theme or, of the week or what was being discussed, then maybe they should have bypassed their own preferences and say, or saved it for another time. When it is chaos, nothing is being built. There is order and a plan in building. When people go to build a house or a building, there's a blueprint and a plan. There's a bill of materials of what's needed. Without that, it's chaos and, and the building doesn't get built right. One of the things I appreciate about St. Andrews is the order of worship. Mark and his staff do a fantastic job each week Put, uh, working to put together a service that fits together. There are elements of praise, commitment, renewal, response. It's orderly and easy to follow along. Verse 27 and 28, Paul goes on to say that if they speak in tongues, they should do it orderly and that someone should be there to interpret it. The person that was speaking in tongues was still in control, and they didn't have to verbalize the tongues. They didn't have to break out into tongues if there wasn't someone there to interpret it for the rest of the congregation. Again, everything was to be done for building up the church. So, for example, and, and I know this isn't quite the same, but I've been in foreign countries uh, or services in foreign countries where uh, the service wasn't, uh, translated uh, into English. And while I could sit there quietly and worship in my own spirit, uh, 
could not really join in with the rest of the congregation with what was being said or prayed. In many ways, I felt like I was outside of the congregation that day. If someone was speaking uh, in tongues and no one was there to translate, the rest of the people would have no idea what was what was said or, or were able to be or were able to join in. It just wasn't appropriate for corporate worship. If someone spoke in tongues, it should be for the building up of the church and everyone learning. It shouldn't dominate the entire day either. Only two or three should speak one at a time. Again, it should all be orderly. Verse 29 through 32. The prophets are given similar guidelines to the tongue speakers. Remember, they didn't have the written Bible that they could all read. God was still revealing his will through prophecy. It was to be orderly, one at a time, not talking over each other, so that everyone could learn and be encouraged through it. When people talk over each other, they don't listen to, be, to what is being said by the other party. So what was going on was the prophets didn't necessarily have a new prophecy each week. So a lot of times they would rehash uh, previous lessons to kind of encourage and uh, reinforce lessons from the past. That is why if someone was given a revelation, others were to sit down and let that person talk. Not only were they to sit there, but they were to weigh what was being said to make sure it was truth and consistent with the other teachings that they had been given in the past. In verse 32, just as those that had uh, just as those that speak in tongues were in control, uh, those that were prophesying were also to be in control of themselves. They didn't have to break out into words. They, they needed to do so orderly. And um, and with structure. Look at verse 33, uh, part A. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Paul lays it out right there. God is a God of peace and order. Look at it. Look at creation. It's, it's full of order and structure. It was perfectly ordered until sin entered in. Sin causes chaos and confusion, God didn't want their worship service to be one of confusion and chaos. The worship service should have been edifying, that is, building up the congregation in their understanding of God and bringing glory to God. It should have been orderly because God is a God of peace. We need to worship God how He wants to be worshipped, not how we want to worship Him. Moving on into the next section, verses 33b through 35. So Paul opens this uh, passage using a similar structure that he did back in chapter 11, verse 16. Paul says that this is how all the churches operate and what is acceptable. Corinth wasn't to have different practices. Corinth hadn't just stumbled onto something. Paul basically was saying, hey guys, this is how it is. So, a little bit of background before we go any further. Apparently, the women or wives in the church were causing a disruption with two issues. They were asking questions during the service and questioning the authority of the leaders. It goes back to edifying an orderly service and being under the authority of leadership. Also, again, background, in that time, women would have had minimal education or less education than men, typically. So they were, were asking basic questions of the faith um, during the service, which was causing issues and disruptions. Perhaps they were sincere questions, and they were desiring to learn, but they would have been better off in, in a home setting uh, 
or, or one-on-one asking these questions. So for instance, if Dale was preaching on the armor of God and someone would stand up and ask, so who is God? And who is the devil? And why don't they get along? And how does Jesus fit in all that? You can see it would be a distraction for the preacher and everyone else sitting in the congregation waiting to uh, and wanting to learn more about the armor of God. And so they would have to sit there and wait uh, while the basic tenets of the faith are, are taught to this one person. It would cause chaos and, and would not build up the congregation as a whole. In verse 34, Paul says, The women are to keep silent in the church, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission. He goes on to say that um, if there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. So what is this talking about? Has Paul lost his train of thought? Because back in verse, or chapter 11, verse 5, he says that w- women were praying and prophesying without head coverings, and this was in a public context and most likely in worship or some sort of worship. So does, does it mean that women can't be a part of, a, of the worship service? No, I don't think that's what Paul is getting at in, in this passage. It goes back to order and authority. They were causing disruptions through their behavior and challenging the authority of the church leadership. They were making a show of it. They were exercising their newly found freedom in an inappropriate way. That is what Paul's admonishing against. They were not to insert themselves into the into leadership roles or usurp leadership. They were to be under the authority of their husbands as we discussed in the first part of chapter 11, where Jesus is under the authority of God, and men are under the authority of Jesus, and wives are under the authority of their husbands. The challenge here, men, is that we need to be studying the Word and be able to answer questions for our family. We need to be teaching the basic tenets of the faith in our homes. We are to be the spiritual leaders of the home. We need to be leaders that make it easy for our wives to follow. Perhaps you're sitting there saying, well, that's all well and great and all, but you don't know the demands of my time. And I I don't even know where to start with something like that. If that's you, I understand. I really do. And I encourage you to reach out to Jason Hunt and ask him if there's someone you can meet with on a regular basis that could disciple you. I know I I meet with a couple guys every couple weeks, and we just do life together, encourage one another, helping each other grow in the faith. Husbands and wives, are you talking about what the Lord is teaching you and revealing to you in Scripture? Are you sharing with one another what you're struggling with? I know I'm kind of getting down a rabbit hole here, but I think this is all important things to to consider. And women, if this passage rubs you the wrong way, I would challenge you to study and pray through this passage. Ask God to reveal to you why there is that rub and if there's any sinful way that is causing it and that needs to be repented. God's values are not the same as the world's values. And and that's tough at times. Moving on, verse 35 through 40. Paul asks these two questions that are just full of sarcasm. He does so to kind of knock them down a bit out of their arrogance and pride. Reading this is kind of like, zing! But then we realize that we're probably in the same boat as the Corinthians or just with different manifestations uh, but with the same underlying issues. Paul really drills home the point here that we are under authority. We shouldn't be puffed up. 
Paul states that if the people were really in Christ, they would recognize that his words were not just preference, but they were actually a commandment of the Lord. The people and leaders, etc., were to be in submission to what Paul is telling them if they were really in Christ. If they didn't submit to it, they were not to be listened to. Paul finishes the section by saying, even though he's been hammering them, not to forbid speaking in tongues, but ultimately desired to prophesy. He calls them brothers again in verse 39, reinforcing the beginning of the section in verse 26. He loves them. He wants them to mature and grow up. Paul has a way of knocking them down and then picking them back up again. He wants them to put away childish actions that they've been doing. He wants their worship to be decent and in order, not a free-for-all, a circus of chaos. God is a God of peace and order. He wants to be worshipped in that way and wants the church to, to build up and edify. We are under His authority. As we approach the throne, we should remember that in all we do. Are we full of pride and arrogance? Are we taking the glory from God when we worship? We need to be in the, in the scriptures to help encourage and build up one another. We need to have order in our relationship with one another, not trying to outdo one another, but approaching each other in love and service. And finally, we need to be under authority of Christ and His will in our lives. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, we just confess our sins. We confess our pride, our arrogance, Lord. We confess where we have not fallen under your authority, Lord. Lord, help us to, to be edifying, to be orderly, to fall under your authority, Lord. Help us to apply this into our lives and into our actions daily, Lord. Lord, we want you to have the glory when we worship. And Lord, we just, we love you. And we want that to be totally evident in everything we do. And Lord, we love you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen.